Well, go for it, Jim. Then okay. why don't you introduce Neil? Well, basically, uh, my my first awareness of Neil's existence <laughs> while I was doing my PhD, we started opening up the Cayenta Gold Springs site and worked at the first season before going on the Boulder to work on my PhD. But I was working out of the Museum of Northern Arizona every summer, and Neil was coming in working with uh, Harvard, with Parrish and Gang in the summers. Our paths would cross a bit then. He worked quite a lot at that time interval with Scott Madsen, who you all know. Uh, and uh, Scott's worked with Neil, done two stints in Ellesmere. I like uh, after he came back from the first year, he's like, ne never again, never again. Year later, yep, again. <laughs> Forgot all the bad stuff, remembered all the good. Uh, but Neil's been uh, working on both ends of the planet. <laughs> He's also, you know, working now extensively in Antarctica. And of course, the work at Ellesmere was going after the the origins of tetrapods, the great transition from aquatic organisms to fully terrestrial organisms, and finding one of the ideal missing links ever found, Tetalic, uh, which we all know and love. I see BJ's got a couple there. Uh, is that a mated pair, BJ? <laughs> but uh you know neil's uh you know has has some ties i've been a, a fan of his work uh for a long time i wish i wish i had the writing skills or even the the narration skills you know his three-part pbs show uh on your inner fish was uh i think one of the best things i've ever seen relative to comparative anatomy on television and you know, not normally the kind of topic you know instead of fighting a couple animals who died how'd you kill them uh really we learned something in that series which was real nice so thank you very much neil for doing this uh, i'm really looking forward to hearing what you got to say tonight oh thank you jim it's um yeah we go way back you know, i was just trying to think when our first interaction was like the early 1980s right I and mean, that was uh, oh, 1981 yeah. 1980 that was a long time ago <laughs> uh, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak tonight to all of you i look forward to talking about your inner fish so what we're going to talk about is finding your inner fish and there's a lot of stories that are embedded in here some are paleontological some are developmental and molecular and some are personal so let me just share some of my slides let me see if i can get this is the scariest part of the thing so share utah allow can everybody see my slides and they're coming. You... There they are. Yep. Okay, can you see? Uh, can you see the slide that says "Finding Your Inner Fish"? Yeah, we got, yep. it. Oh. got it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So Excellent. yeah, you never know. So um, you know, so this all begins with you know finding your inner fish. What's this inner fish theme anyway? Well, for me, it began when I moved to Chicago about 23 years ago. I came as chairman of the anatomy department, and my big teaching responsibility was to teach human anatomy to the medical students. Now. That is a very stressful course, both to learn and teach in, because you know, for our, for our medical students, they're learning thousands of new names of anatomical structures. Uh, they're dissecting cadavers, you know, in, in the lab. And so it's amazingly stressful. So you know, to, to sort of decrease the stress, what I used to do is to hang around the dissection tables and get to know the students and let them get to know me. And almost invariably they'd say, hey, Dr. Shudan, what, kind of, what kind of doctor are you? You know, are you a cardiologist? Are you a neurosurgeon? And I'd say, no, I'm a fish paleontologist. And they're like, what? I want my money back. <laughs> but, but soon it became clear that being a paleontologist, and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist, is a very powerful way to learn and teach human anatomy. And the reason for that is that many of the best roadmaps to our own bodies lie in other creatures. The best roadmaps for the complex tangle of nerves in our head lie in sharks and fish. Some of the best roadmaps to understanding the basic structure of our brain lie in reptiles. And the reason for this is because in every organ, in every tissue, in every cell, in every gene in our bodies, we contain millions if not billions of years of the history of life. That's inside of us. And that's kind of what the whole theme of your inner fish was. And the thing about it is we learn this when we go out and find fossils around the world, we learn this when we start to compare the anatomy of creatures that are alive today. 
And we learn it when we look at the embryos and how they develop, how they go from egg to adult, and we compare them to different creatures. So really that's the theme of your inner fish. But the origin story for this actually begins in another way too, when I was a graduate student. So I was, um, you know, when, I, when I first met Chip in the early 80s, I was beginning my graduate studentship and I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I liked it all. I loved Triassic, I loved Cretaceous, <clears throat> excuse me, I loved Jurassic. But I, so I didn't know what I wanted to do for thesis. And so I took a, cor I took a course with uh, the late Farish Jenkins, who was a professor um, at the graduate school I was at. <clears throat> and um, Farish was leading a seminar on like the greatest hits in the history of vertebrate evolution. You know, so every week it would be like a different transition. And I remember in one of the early weeks, he showed this slide from a textbook at the time, which was done by Len Radinsky, who was then at the University of Chicago, <clears throat> the late Len Radinsky, who was then at the University of Chicago. And in this slide, Len uh, and his uh, wife, Sharon Emerson, they, they, they collaborated to produce a little cartoon that showed what we kind of knew about, in a very simplified form, of what we knew about the transition from life in water to life in land in vertebrates. And so what you see on the top, is a lobe fin fish. It's a cartoon of a lobe fin fish. These are creatures we first pick up in the fossil record oh, about 390 million years ago. Okay, so they're, they're pretty ancient. And what you can see, it's like a normal fish, right? It has a conical head with eyes on either side and it has fins. Look at the bottom and what you see is a cartoon of what we knew at the time of one of the earliest land dwelling animals, an early tetrapod. Uh, this is a creature um, that, was from, that was first found in rocks about 365 million years old. And you can see it has limbs, it has a flat head with eyes on top, it has a neck that can swivel around. There are a lot of transitions, a lot of differences here. So I remember looking at the slide and thinking, holy cow, that's a first class scientific problem. How did fish evolve to walk on land? You know, and so I thought to myself, well, what can you do here? I mean, you know, <laughs> let's find, let's, let's go out and find some fossils that tell us about this. <clears throat> so that really became my initial quest as graduating from graduate school was I gave up the Triassic, I gave up the Jurassic, I gave up the Cretaceous, and I realized I had to go down into the Devonian if I wanted to get this done. And, you know, so I wanted to find something that was kind of intermediate between the fish on top and the tetrapod on the bottom. And, you know, to do that, what I pulled out was the paleontological playbook, thing, the, the playbook that paleontologists had used successfully for over a century before, you know, before I, had, before I was born. And the idea is if you want to find important fossils, say to tell us about this question, answer a question. What you do is you look for places in the world that have three things. It's really kind of simple in, 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 in an overview, but it's actually very complex in, in details. You look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to answer the question, right? So in this case, what are the, what's the age? Well, I told you the first loaf and fish are about 390 million years old. The first tetrapod is about 365 million years old. So you want to be in that interval of time from 390 to 365, which is in the Devonian. It actually gets a lot more precise if you start to layer in more fossils. It becomes into the sort of middle to late development. So, you know, you have the right time. Then you need rocks that are the right type to hold the fossils. Obviously, not every kind of rock does that. In this case, we knew we wanted rocks that were formed in ancient rivers and streams or ancient nearshore ocean environments, not the deep sea, uh, not, you know, not in aeolian sediments, you know, in, in the deserts. We knew we wanted things that were formed in rivers, streams, pond, ponds, maybe tidal environments. So we knew that, we knew the right geology. So we had rocks of the right age, and we knew what kind of rocks we were looking for. And finally, we wanted rocks that are exposed to the surface that we can access. And really it's those three things, right? It's rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, and rocks that are accessible and exposed. And you kind of look for though that mix everywhere you go. <clears throat> there was another thing in my, in my life, and that was I, I had no money. So when I, um, that's the fourth variable, lack of money. <laughs> so I, I, when I took my first academic job, I was in the University of Pennsylvania, which is in the southeastern, it was in Philadelphia, in the southeastern corner of the state of Pennsylvania. And so when I moved to Philly, I realized that I didn't have the money to do a really an exotic field program, <laughs> nor did I have the ability to take on a lot of risk. So I wanted something that was kind of local that I could do, you know, with turnpike tolls and gas money, right? And I wasn't fortunate enough to live in Utah, of course, <laughs> where I could do that there. But in Pennsylvania, it tended to be pretty good. So what you see here is we dug it out. Ted Deschler, who was a graduate student working with me at the time, and who's been a collaborator in pretty much everything that I can tell you about today. Ted and I pulled out a geological map of Pennsylvania, looking for Devonian. And basically, I stripped that geological map here of everything unimportant. And what you're seeing in purple is where the Devonian is. So basically, Pennsylvania has Devonian all over it. And it has Devonian pretty much of the right age, you know, in that 390 to 365 window, actually in the middle Devonian, late Devonian, it's perfect. 
So Pennsylvania, it turns out, had rocks of the right age, about three hours from my, my home in Philadelphia. So rocks of the right age is great. Didn't have rocks of the right type? Well, if you want to think about what Pennsylvania looked like um, 365 million years ago, get Pittsburgh, get Harrisburg, and get Philadelphia out of your brain and think Amazon Delta, right? This is a cartoon of what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago. You had a highlands to the east, kind of where the Pocono Mountains are today. You had a, a sea to the west, kind of where Pittsburgh and Cleveland are today. And draining from east to west across the state at the time in the Lake Devonian were rivers and streams, you know, and they led into the ocean. Now, if you're a paleontologist looking for critters, you know, just the cusp of the transition from life and water to life on land, this kind of package of sediments is perfect, right? Because if you have the right exposures, you can sample ancient estuaries, you can sample ancient oxbow lakes, ponds, streams, you name it, you got it here. So it turns out we got really lucky in Pennsylvania. We had rocks more or less of the right age, um, not entirely perfect, but close enough. And we had rocks that were formed in the right environments. So then it became really kind of finding in Pennsylvania where the right exposures are to find the rocks. And that's not trivial in Pennsylvania because there's cities, there's forests, there's stuff. It turns out the best places for us to look for fossils were road cuts that were made by the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation when they cut new roads. So every now and then in the, well, the early 90s, when, when we started this hunt, um, we would discover that PennDOT, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, would be like widening a road in an area where there was mapped Devonian rock. And so we'd go, we'd, you know, go out there like a, you know, <laughs> like a beeline, you know, and this turned out to be one of the great sites <laughs> in central Pennsylvania. This is in central Pennsylvania. It's about three and a half, four hours from Philadelphia. It's about an hour north of State College, Pennsylvania. If you look all the way on the right for scale, you can see our cars and you can see, I don't have a pointer here, but you can see a human being uh, on the cliffs on the right there to give you a scale. So these are Devonian strata. You can see the layers of the Devonian rock. You can see they form red beds. These are ancient meandering streams shown in cross section. So you have ancient streams, an ancient delta system shown in cross section, dated around 365 million years old, roughly, because uh, it's done by biostratigraphy. But almost as soon as we got to this site, we started to find cool stuff. We started to find first like teeth the size of railroad spikes, you know, big monstrous fish spikes. Then we start to find jaws of these creatures. The jaws would be the length of your arm. Here's Ted holding the front end of one of these jaws, just giant jaws. You can see some of the teeth and cross section there. Um, then we started to find all kinds of like armored fish. You see like it's a squash one, but there were some good fish in there that were you know, armored. And then while I was gone, Ted working in that site found a, um, an early tetrapod, limb bone uh, and a shoulder of an early tetrapod. It's a humerus of an early limbed animal. Um, it's an upper arm bone. Um, very similar to that creature, you know, of the bones of that creature I showed you in a cartoon earlier that was known from Greenland. We started to find shoulders, we started to find leg bones, arm bones, really all by the side of this road in Pennsylvania. It was really fabulous. And so working with the National Geographic Society, <clears throat> we reconstructed what that road cut, the environment that that road cut represented 365 million years ago. And what you had was a small, like sort of freshwater stream. It had on the borders, we had plants. You see some of the earliest trees and shrubs. And then when you look in the water, what you have is in the center, you can see that big fish, you know, with the teeth the size of railroad spikes. That was a fish that was about 15 feet long. Uh, then there were a series of armored fish you could see around here. That's a little armored one. And then a many different species of early limb animals, early tetrapods. You can see them drawn through here. So Ted and I were really delighted by this, but we realized we had a bit of a problem. We were in rocks too young to find the kind of critter I wanted to bridge the gap between tetrapod and fish and tetrapod. We were already finding diverse tetrapods all through here, and they were pretty well advanced or derived. Let me just go back to the slides. So remember this slide, right? So you can see that we were already finding lots of tetrapods on the bottom, right? But what I wanted and what Ted wanted, we wanted like a flat-headed fish with fins with arm bones on side, inside. You know, what you can see is the fish on top has a conical head with eyes on either side. The early tetrapods have a flat head with eyes on top. Um, that fish on top doesn't have a neck. Early tetrapods have a neck. We weren't finding anything really intermediate. So in looking at the paleontological record of things other people had discovered from around the world, it became clear that we had to push this search back by about 10 or 15 million years in time. 
So we wanted rocks like those rocks we were in the Catskill formations of Pennsylvania, but we needed them to be older. We needed them not to be 365 million years old. We needed them closer to 375 or 380. So there began a new hunt. So we started to think about, okay, where are we gonna go? Where are places with rocks of that right age with rocks of the right type? So this actually is a true story. It began in my office in the late 1990s. <clears throat> Ted and I were having an argument. <laughs> it's about something geographic, geological. And to settle the debate, I pulled out my college geology textbook, Evolution of the Earth by Dot and Batten. This is the second edition. Um, it's been through many editions with different authors now. Anyway, we settled the debate and I was just going through the, the book and I found a diagram, which was to change my life in a college geology textbook. So here's the diagram. And so this is kind of what you're looking for if you're a paleontologist, honestly. Um, so this is like a diagram from that textbook. And it says in the bottom, it says upper Devonian sedimentary facies, right? So these are the sedimentary rocks in the upper Devonian. And you can see it's a map of North America and superimposed on that map. Uh, are the depositional environments of the upper Devonian age rocks. And you can see in Western North America, kind of like where you are and, and both North and South, um, you have rocks that were formed in marine depositional environments. But then these authors identify three areas where the rocks were formed in ancient Delta systems, you know, rivers and streams leading to the ocean. All right, so that got my eye, caught my eye. I colorized it, but you know, the first one, Okay, saw that. That's the Catskill. That's the one that I've been showing you. Been there, done that. That's the Catskill formation that Ted and I have been working on. The next one, been there, done that too. I hadn't done that, but this is from East Greenland. You know that tetrapod, the cartoon tetrapod I've been showing you? Well, that's derived from a fossil that was discovered in the 1930s by Swedish teams working in uh, East Greenland. Okay, you see where I'm going? Extending 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic was mapped Devonian age rocks um, that was um, mapped not only as coming from ancient delta systems, but coming from, rock from an age that's 10 to 15 million years older than the other two sites. <laughs> it was like perfect. And all this from, from a uh, college geology textbook. So I said, uh, I looked at Ted, I said, Ted, do you know anybody who's worked these rocks? He says, I don't know, do you know anybody? He said, I just asked you that question. It's like, nobody works these rocks. So, um, so we were really excited. So we went to the library and dug out um, some of the initial literature that was cited in this um, in this textbook, and it turned out to be beautiful. It turned out to be so many um, so many different exposures of these rocks across 1,500 kilometers of the Canadian Arctic. I mean, this is all in the morning that we this happened all in the morning in 1998 in my office in Philly. And so we went to have Chinese food, and I had a fortune cookie that changed my life after that Chinese food. It said, "Soon you'll be sitting on top of the world." <laughs> I kid you not, that's the fortune cookie we have. So I looked at Ted and you looked at me and said, guys, we, we get, we're out of here. We're, we're done. We're going to do it. Okay, so now we had a new problem, which is how to work these sites. So this is the sort of a colorized version of one of the paper, an illustration from one of the papers that led us there. So in the upper left, you see where we're at. We're in Nunavut territory. You can see the flag of Nunavut up there in the upper left. And bounded in red is the Nunavut uh, territory. It's vast, northern Canada. Now focus on the main body of the slide. And what you see are these are the islands of, 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 of the high Arctic islands of Canada and circled in red are where middle and upper Devonian age rocks are exposed to the surface. So really that is our hunting ground. And if you look, you can see the, um, the scale is hundred kilometers. So that's, that's big, it's fast, you know, there's a lot and there's a lot of exposure there. If it's not covered by ice, it's exposed rock. It's really gorgeous. All right, so this was uh, this is a bit of a challenge now instead of driving three hours or four hours to our field sites, we now had to work in sites about 700 miles from the North Pole. And it came with a whole lot of challenges. You know, you know up there, you, there are no roads. You have to get around with helicopters and airplanes and, and rotary aircraft. Um, it's daylight 24 hours a day in the summer. It's dark 24 hours a day in the winter. You know, there's whole logistic issues of working up there. There are polar bears up there and you know, polar bears eat people. <laughs> you know, I don't want that. So we had all kinds of new logistic uh, challenges. To give you a sense of how remote some of these sites are, the nearest town to where our sites are is about 280 miles away. It houses about 180 Inuit year round. And this is a picture of that town, Greece Fjord, Greece Fjord Canada uh, in spring. So this is a big city. So we're really, really remote. So to get around what we have to rely on are helicopters and air and, and rotary wing and fixed wing aircraft. But we're beyond the tank of gas of a helicopter. So the fixed wing aircraft are, can land on the tundra uh, and they bring in fuel and food and people. 
and then the helicopters will ferry us uh, to our camps. So it's a lot of logistics to figure out. And so what we do is we have to really take a very small crew. We don't take a lot of people. We don't take a lot of gear because uh, weights are at a, max, or a minimum. Everything has to be, every pound is accounted for. And kind of this is what camp looks like before we, before we set it up. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's really kind of a logistic pit, um, trick. You can see our food is in those white tubs because they seal really tight. There are polar bears on the ice there. So, you know, we, we, and they have a great sense of smell. So we have to be very careful about that. Okay, so here's what we did. So we had the fortune cookie in 1998. And in 1999, this is our, one of our first field sites, we started in the western part of the um, Arctic. And so you can see our tents there. And, the, and there's the kitchen tent, that big white one. And then each of us have our own mountaineering tent. We pitch near permanent snowfields um, where we can get the um, water uh, right, out of the, right out of the melting glaciers. And the, what you can see here are, in 1999 is the exposures we work with, which were very poor. So what you can see is it's very flat country there in, the, in this part of the Arctic, in the western part of the Arctic. Now, we would find fossils at the surface weathering out, but it turns out we had plopped on the wrong place completely. Um, we had plopped on, uh, we had come down on sediments that were a little too flat to give us great exposure. Um, and we also um, were in deep sea sediments. It was mapped wrong. Uh, these were deep sea sediments, not formed in ancient rivers and streams. This is, we were in the middle of an ancient ocean. And you're not going to find the fossils we're looking for in the, in the middle of an ancient ocean. So that was, you know what, chalk that one up to experience. <laughs> it was a failure, but it was a, uh, it was a reasonable failure. We learned how to work in the Arctic. We learned, uh, you know, we learned um, how to find fossils there. You know, so when you fail, you learn. And we were fortunate enough to be able to go back. And so the next year, uh, we went back. So, so we were in the middle of an ancient ocean. So this is from Pennsylvania, but imagine it's the Arctic. We're in the middle of the ocean. So what we wanted to do here is go upstream. And going upstream in these ancient environments meant, in the Arctic, going east. So then we went east in the next year. This is 2000. This is when Scott Madison joined us, uh, Jim. And um, in this year, you can see we had a new kitchen tent. So we had our own personal tents. And look at here. Look across that fjord. Those are the Devonian sediments. Now look at that. Those are exposures you really want. Because now, now you have rocks that are being carved by glaciers. They form beautiful, nice exposures, even like band lands exposures in certain places. And the rocks were formed in ancient rivers and streams. Now, we started to find bits and pieces of the kinds of fish we were looking for, but underlie that we were finding bits and pieces. And the reason for that is these rocks are from ancient rivers and streams, but they were very fast moving rivers and streams. Um, and the bones were all broken up. So we needed something which had. The kinds of sediments which we really wanted were the ones that are from slow moving rivers and streams and where we had the overbanks, where we had the, the, the sediments that would be forming on either side of the stream during flooding events. So we looked around for those. And again, this was a learning experience. We didn't find much great that season. But then in our third season, we went to another valley, this valley here. And this is a really exceptional photograph because what it shows is the fossil site right before it was discovered. So Ted had taken this picture after he finished lunch one day in this site. It's about 100 miles from where, where I just showed you before. And you can see below, you can see this beautiful exposures there, the sort of red brown rock. Um, there's a little blue patch there. And that little blue patch is a human being who was going to, uh, who's going to walk over those rocks a little bit later and find fossils. Um, turns out that that site um, where you can see is covered by a carpet of fish bones. And you can see those, that, in the hand here, those are the kinds of fish bones that were discovered. And so we went to that site that evening and crawled it and found thousands upon thousands of fish bones at the surface. Now, what we were doing is crawling that site to try to find the layer that those bones came from. It took us a couple of weeks, but we found the layer. And this is Ted in yellow and the rest of the crew. We had found this layer. The layer that produced all those thousands of bones was a layer that contained skeletons of fossil fish piled one on top of the other. And you know, the fragments were produced as that layer um, eroded away. And those fish skeletons would range in size from about six inches long to about you know, four feet long. It was really remarkable. So here we hit a jackpot for a site that contained lots of skeletons. And so we worked it for a year, a summer, a year, a summer and didn't really find any new species. So we decided this is gonna be our fourth and last year, we were running out of money. And so we hit the site again, and so we had six people and we all lined up next to each other on this site cracking rocks and we're finding you know fish skeletons but nothing too new but then everything changed 
when we, well, this is the site. Everything changed when my colleague, Steve Gatesy. So you see Steve Gatesy in blue and then Farris Jenkins, actually late Farris Jenkins is in the tan jacket there. What you see is in the center here, um, you could, if you look carefully, what you can see is like a little V-shaped structure. That V-shaped structure, as soon as we saw it, we knew what we, um, we had found what we had uh, been looking for. And that is we had found a, not just a head of a fish, but the head of a flat headed fish. Remember I told you that we were looking for something with a flat head. Here we had something that had a flat head. Um, and so the, and the skull was sticking out at us. And so what we did is we just carved out the rest of it, um, just isolated the rest of it, took it out with plaster, uh, jacketed it, brought it back like any paleontologist would. And as we did that, we found that year three more of these things. So we came back at, that year with four of these, of these critters. So let me show you this one. It comes back in the, in the base of a helicopter <laughs> and then, you know, a sling of a helicopter and then gets transported back to the lab. So that specimen I just showed you, after about five months of preparation, this is what it looked like. And look at it, you see, look, we have a flat head with eyes on top. You can sort of see two orbits there. If you look carefully, here's this specimen after another few months of preparation. Boom, flat head, eyes on top. You can see two shoulders back there. Um, and there's, um, it looks like it has a neck where the head is separated from the shoulder. So this is just the idea here. You know, if you're a paleontologist looking for an intermediate fossil, let's say a flat headed fish with fins with arm bones inside, you look for places in the world that have rocks the right age, rocks the right type, rocks that are exposed to the surface. You fail a little bit, learn from your failures, and boom, this is, um, this is the critter. Now we now have about 20 individuals of these. They're not particularly rare. So this is the critter. If I was to hold it in front of you, this particular specimen, we now have, and we now have it to the base of the tail. So we, when we described it in 2006, we only described the front end, we've since described the back end. <laughs> and what you have is a critter, it's about four feet long, um, has scales in its back, and you can see also it has fins with fin webbing. But like an early limbed animal, it has a flat head with eyes on top, it has a neck, and when you crack open the fin, what do you find? It has an upper bones of the upper arm, forearm, even parts of the wrist, and potentially even digits. Inside a fin, really remarkable. So it kind of blew us away. Um, so the critter, you know, is a real mix, like a low fin fish. It has fins and scales and primitive jaws and other things as well. Like an early, um, like a tetrapod, it has a neck, wrists, flat head, expanded ribs, has both lungs and gills. Um, it's really remarkable. And so we've since, you know, since we found this in 2004, We've since found a number more of them. In fact, we have a whole new genus of this creature we're describing now, <clears throat> which, we, uh, which is new. Um, but you know, we're able to use CT scanning to see the fin. So here's the fin, it has an upper arm bone, a forearm, even parts of a wrist. Look at the left, that on the left, you can see the, the joints of the, of the bones. You have an A, here's the shoulder of the animal. In B, you have the elbow of the animal. In C and D, you have portions of the wrist of the animal, the so-called proximal carpal and, and distal carpal joints. We've been able to use new technology to, re to reconstruct the entire animal. Um, and this is a reconstruction we're gonna be publishing in the coming year, uh, which is the latest, which shows we have the vertebral column, we have the ribs, we have the fore fins, we have the hind fins. Um, you know, so this is the current state of the art of, of this critter, uh, which is really kind of much more elaborate than we originally um, published on in, in 2006. So that's what you'll be seeing published probably in the, Ooh, I don't know, hopefully every summer, if everything goes smoothly. So, you know, as the discoverers of this new critter, we were given the opportunity to name it. And so what we did is we, um, we wanted to work with the Inuit Council of Elders to come up with a name that was, that, that, that would matter because we worked there with them at their pleasure. And so we wanted a name that had two things. We wanted a name that was meaningful to them and to us. And we wanted a name that, you know, could be pronounced in a wide variety of cultures. The name of the committee you see here on the left did not lend me a lot of uh, confidence that would come up with a name that could be pronounced. Um, so <laughs> it was actually kind of a hard task. So I spoke to the gentleman in the middle uh, about this, and we, it was really hard to come to, to find a name that uh, was meaningful to both of us. Finally, he just said to me, he said, look, just tell me what this creature is and where it lived. I said, why, it's a large freshwater fish. He said, why did you say so? You got yourself a tick taller. I said, the Tiktaalik, what's that? He says, a large freshwater fish in their language. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's the name. <laughs> um, so Tiktaalik, uh, which is this genus, and actually there's a new genus gonna be coming out called Kikakania, uh, hopefully in another few months, um, is a creature with you know fins, with limb bones inside, has lungs and gills, 
It has fish-like structures in its shoulder and pelvis, but also tetrapod-like structures. Um, it has a tetrapod-like head, but still with fishy bones inside. So it's a real mix of these features, of these, of these, um, of these critters. Um, and, but the interesting story for today is that, you know, you, you, Tiktaalik is part of a number of fossils we have that connect fish to tetrapods. It's not just the only one. There are many of them now and many different gene, genera. And in fact, this is just an old diagram. If I was to add a new diagram, it would show yet another genus or two genera, genus or two um, that would bridge this gap beautifully. But the thing about it is, it's not only sort of bridges the gap, but it says something about us. And that's the inner fish piece, which I want to close with. You know, that is, you can trace the arm bones of Tiktaalik to amphibians, to reptiles, to other mammals, to people. You can trace the humerus all the way through there. You can trace the elbow all the way through there. You can trace the neck all the way through there. So I like to think that is, you know, every time you bend your wrist, every time you shake your head with a neck, <laughs> you could thank Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins for inventing those fe features all the way back in the Devonian. That is, we can trace our bodily structures all the way back to this, some of them, all the way back to this great uh, event in the late Devonian. So this kind of thinking really changes the way you see things. So, I mean, you look at this guy here and you see Albert Einstein, sort of a pinnacle of human achievement. When you're a fish paleontologist working the Devonian, what you see is just a, basically a bipedal fat old fish. And if you compare Professor Einstein to the fish, uh, they're labeled here, by the way, Einstein's on your left, um, you can use paleontology and developmental biology to show the links between these two. Like I said, I showed you the paleontology bit, right? And I could trace that. But here's the embryology piece that's really cool. That is, if you look at the head of Einstein or you and me <clears throat> a few weeks after conception, this is kind of what it looked like. You had paired primordia for the eyes on the top, and then you had a series of swellings, what's known as the pharyngeal area, which I've color coded. They're paired, right? Light blue, dark blue, green, and yellow. And they, those, those swellings contain cells, and they're separated from each other uh, by clefts. Well, guess what? If you look at fish, like sharks, uh, fish and sharks, here's a shark. Uh, the embryo is not identical, but you have paired primordia for the eyes, and you have those same swellings, which I've color-coded for you. Now, it's useful to ask, what do the cells inside those swellings become? Well, if you look at a shark, that first one in light blue in the embryo, if you trace those cells, they become portions of the upper and lower jaw. And the other ones, the dark blue and the green and the yellow, they become portions of the gill apparatus. This stuff becomes portions of the bones, the muscles, and the arteries and nerves of the gill apparatus. Well, what happens in humans? The first one becomes part of the jaw and two bones in the middle ear. The second dark blue one becomes part of a little uh, hook-shaped hook, 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 hook bone in the base of the throat called the hyoid, as well as one bone in the middle ear. And the others become portions of the voice box as well as the muscles and nerves and bones that control about. So if you're just to have this comparison here, you would say many of the muscles and the nerves and the bones I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the muscles and nerves and bones you're using to hear me with right now, correspond to gill structures in fish. And guess what? If you look at the fossil record, I could show you a transformation of one of those gill bones into an ear bone. That's how amazing this is. We can use multiple lines of evidence to show us how these, um, these different creatures compare. And we really have a beautiful, you know, when, when we think about <coughs> revolutions in biology, you know, when you think about you and me, we are about, oh, we have about 20 to 30 trillion cells in our bodies. But we began as a single cell, a fertilized egg. So we call that system going from a single cell, that fertilized egg, to a body with trillions of cells, we call that bodybuilding. And one of the great puzzles of biology which we've been having, seeing some remarkable discoveries in the last several decades, is going from that single cell to the trillion celled creature you see on the right. And what that involves is an understanding of how DNA works and how it becomes active as the embryo is built from egg to adult um, and how the genes respond to the environment. But one thing we've learned really beautifully in the past several decades is just what that DNA recipe is inside the egg that, help, that instructs cells to build a body. And it's really remarkable. And the more remarkable thing is this. Let me just give you an example. There are genes that make our basic body architecture. Here you see a human, and I've color coded the, the, the vertebral column. There are genes that are active in the embryo, and they can instruct the cells to become part, to become you know, our body, you know, our basic body architecture. Turns out that many of the genes that build our basic body architecture are seen 
in the embryos of flies, building what? The basic body architecture of flies. Turns out that the basic bodybuilding genes, the toolkit that builds bodies as different as flies, worms, frogs, fish, and people, is very much the same among these different creatures. So you can ask your question, you can ask me a question, you say, okay, Neil, who cares about your inner fish? And I'd say to you, the Nobel Prize Committee in Medicine and Physiology uh, cares a whole lot about your inner fish. Because if you think about you know, the basic breakthroughs that, um, that have contributed to biomedical research that have won the Nobel Prize over the past 50 years, who have they gone to? They've gone to people working on flies. They've gone to people working on, worm, uh, on worms. They've gone to people working on mice. They've gone to people working on yeast. In fact, two Nobel Prizes awarded to five people in the last 15 years have gone to people working on a little tiny worm the size of a comma and piece of paper. And that's, you know, Cena Red Bettis elegans, which, you know, we, which tells us how our, how our cells are programmed to naturally die, how our genes are turned off and on, and what happens and goes wrong in diseases like cancer. I'd like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us, from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives are in some way based on flies, worms, and in some cases, even fish. I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much. Very good, nice. <laughs> My pleasure.